Hello everyone, welcome to History Pitch 10. We have 10 shows on our back catalogue, which is absolutely astounding. And uh, here we are on the, is it the 30th? What's the date today? 31st. 31st of January, good, 2013. Uh, and I'm in the studio with Josie and with Saman, our new guest. So we'll get back to him later in the show. Uh, and we're hoping that a few other people will arrive in the course of the next hour. Otherwise it would just be us. But, you know, that's all right. So, Josie, what happened today in history? Okay, so today, uh, in 1797, Franz Schubert, the Austrian composer, was born. Uh, in 1606, Guy Fawkes was hanged, drawn and quartered Ooh. for his part in the gunpowder plot. Wow. Uh, in 1943, the Battle of Stalingrad ended. Um, in... Uh... 1935, the Soviet Premier tells Japan to get out of Manchuria, and that would lead to the Soviet-Japan War. Yeah. Um, so Schubert, yeah. Guy Fawkes, and Manchuria. And Stalingrad ended. That's Stalingrad ending. That was bad. Stalingrad was bad. Yeah. Mm. Uh, in 1968, in Vietnam, the Tet Offensive begins as the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese soldiers attack strategic and civilian locations throughout South Vietnam. It must have been really cold in South Vietnam on the 31st of January. Possibly. Is that when it's winter? Yeah. 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 Cold. I, I don't know. Time to begin There's not really a lot today, actually. It's... The smallest amount. Schubert. I hope that Artemis comes and uh, she's going to tell us things about Schubert, I think. Uh, romance, early death, 32, I think he was when he died. Um, thank you, JC. That was this day in history. So before uh, we launch into um, other exciting, you have multiple pieces of electronic technology here. Is this new? No. It's very nice. I just don't usually bring it. What is it? It's a, a tablet. Mm. Can you? But it's not an Apple tablet. It's no, there are other types there of are tablets. Other types of tablets. But it's small. It's like a big. It's like a cross between an, a phone and a like sort that. of iPad. Yeah, it's small. It's the size is okay. Yeah. I'll stop being <laughs> fascinated by that. Technologically uh, out there. Yeah, I know. Well, we've already discussed my Luddite nature-ness. Um So let us let us see where Erica is today. Hello, Erica. Can you come in? Hey, how's it going? How are you doing? I'm not too bad. I spent a fabulous weekend in Leicester last week. That's fantastic. With me. With you. It's fantastic. <laughs> Do you remember that? I do. We had a lovely time. We did have a lovely time, although I, I did get an insight into the reason you need to wear so much padded clothing. It's because it's so cold. Well, not only is, this was the weekend, everyone, that it snowed, and Erica does not have any heating in her house. It was <laughs> freezing. It was freezing. We did some method acting history. <laughs> we method acted Victorians. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they didn't have puffer jackets, so. But weirdly, I don't feel the cold. I don't want to detain you on this subject, subject too long. But you, you were not dealing with it as well as I was. No, but neither were other people in the house dealing with it well. I think you're no, weird, no. weirdly yeah. diverse. I know, I know. Basically, the hangs was a poor decision on my part. <laughs> and now I have to show, I have to show that I'm not cold at all times. Yeah, it's like the song. Speaking of the Somme, you've, commit, you've committed, it's like something that you've committed so much, just to make that clear to the listeners, that you can't give up now. But exactly. speaking of the Somme, we went to see some dead soldiers. We did, exactly. So amongst the exciting things we did in Leicester, we went to a graveyard, <laughs> which maybe your metropolitan types don't think is an interesting thing to do, but in Leicester, it's certainly on the highlights of the tour. <laughs> I had a fabulous time. It was snowing like mad, but Erica knows that graveyard backwards. I got the, like, this is the favourite gravestone to it. Of course, it's quite a large municipal Victorian, presumably, graveyard. Yeah, like, I love graveyards. Like, uh, one of my favourites is Glasnow and Sanity in the north uh, of Dublin City, and this one in Leicester, and both of them are these sort of gothic masterpieces that they have a slightly wonky, crooked, sort of mausoleum-type enormous graves poking in all directions, kind of like broken teeth. And they're incredibly creepy places and kind of awesome for history as well. So, 
you know, you get to, to run around these graves and do history and sort of scrape the ivy off to read the names below, and I think that's all quite evocative. Yes, We're touching the past. It's kind of dub- doubly layered, isn't it, that here are these dead people buried, but you also have to scrape off the detritus of the intervening years in order to, you know, there's a nice little metaphor there in order to access them. But one of the most poignant things I find about graveyards is that you get this name and then you get dates, two dates, and the whole mm-hmm. person's life, all their loves and hopes and fears and pains and whatever else they happen to them is cap- encapsulated by this dash. Oh, that's terrible. Isn't it? Isn't yeah. it? Isn't it? So why is what we used to, what, why is the tribute to our life? Why is it, why is our, mar- our lives marked by our dates of entry and exit rather than by the process? Oh, that's amazing, isn't it? Um, and also, like, when we talk about, like, the difficulties of chronology or thinking about temporalities or whatever, but at the end of the day, you get these two dates on a grave and a dash, and it's, it normally says very, very little about what people do in between. Um, but there was, you're right. there was one remarkable grave, which I, I only vaguely remember the details of, and perhaps you can tell me about the woman in the parachute. Okay, can, well, have you got any favourite graves you can discuss? I can make like two. I've got one in New College Chapel. Okay. Uh, well, there's two. There's two in Leicester. And there was one uh, There was one who was a man who was a credit to the world of cycledom. And he was one of the first professional cyclists. And I think he, he died very young. He falls off his bike <laughs> in the late 19th century. I don't think we showed you that one. No. Because it's one under a foot of snow. So he's there. And one of the lines in the grave is, Wheelman of the world loved him and respected him. Brilliant. And that's yeah, that's kind of fantastic. And actually, that one is exactly the opposite of what you say. It's, it's incredibly discursive. It's got a lot of text in it describing what an excellent cyclist this man was. And then the other one is this woman, and gosh, I can't remember her name. But anyway, actually, it's kind of interesting because it is just, it's a very silent grave, and it's just a name, and it's two dates, and it's sort of saying, like, why was she taken from us so soon, or whatever, you know, it's, it's very, very plain. But actually, the story behind the grave, and there's sort of a plaque at the top of, at the end of Celeste, so much you telling you the story behind the grave, is this woman was a, um, uh, she worked in a hotel in Leicester and she was in her very early 20s and this is just in the days uh, it was in the early 1920s and it was just when an awful lot of pilots had been decommissioned from the RAF and these men were sort of uh, touting their services around uh, provincial Britain trying to earn some money and one of these decommissioned men was literally going to fairs and flying his plane, and anyone who wanted to could parachute out of the plane. I'm like, like God, talk about health and safety. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this would not be alive. No. Uh, and this woman gets in the plane, and she jumps out, and her parachute doesn't open, she oh. smacks the ground and dies. Oh. It's incredibly tragic, and it's all, it was all over the headlines of the news. Well, presumably everybody... Like the Daily Express. Everybody was there and saw it. Exactly, and like she's there. These photos from the, the Daily Express are incredible because she's there wearing her interwar clothes, you know, her little sort of cloche hat and her sort of dress and things, with all this flying gear on top of it. You know, it's not like she's wearing any proper clothing or anything. It's absolutely incredible. So that one's very, you know, a culturally specific death, as I would say. It's a, you know, it's a 1920s demise, because all these factors were only in play in the 1920s. Right, the new woman, the aeroplane. Exactly, the, the roguish commer- decommissioned officer. Yeah. <laughs> the commercialisation of, well, yeah. <laughs> it, thrill. Um, <clears throat> can you tell me, as an urban historian, why graveyards appear in the mid to late 19th century, these municipal graveyards? When I mean, Patrick Joyce talks about this in that in chapter of one of that book. Well, what does Patrick Joyce say? He's a gosh. He says something, something like that this is about the management of time and dead. the dead get exiled from the church where they, you know, buried in the cemetery, church graveyard, or even inside the church and where parishioners would have had a daily and sort of weekly and ongoing relationship to them, like literally walking over them every Sunday. And then okay. they sort of put to the edges of the city where they're ordered and regulated in these pseudo city, you know, the avenues and they're segregated often according to religion, I mean, denomination and they're typologized and, and it, yeah, and death is sort of managed. So yeah. temporal <laughs> management. 
It does sound that way, and hidden to a certain extent as well. And hidden, yeah. But why, I mean, is this just part of the, I mean, he says it's part of the liberal creation, the liberal subject, but what happens in the 19th century that means the state is... Yeah, like, it sounds like, well, I, know what, I haven't read that bit, <laughs> but it, it sounds like it's to do with hygiene as well, like, you know, the same imperatives right. that were driving the city camp to control abattoirs and to control the circulation of things like blood and feces and water are also driving them to control the spaces of death, right? So it's about demarking the boundaries of a of a rational, brightly lit, clean, hygienic city in which we give people the spaces in which they can be the liberal subject. I presume is this the, this is the argument, yeah, right? This is, you're right. So it's like this is a permeation of that of the boundary of the living of the clean, hygienic self. Yeah, like death it, death does that as as much as shit does. Exactly, exactly. And also, like, this is, you know, this is the age when you, you get an awful lot of things. You get, you know, the mass proliferation of the public toilet, so, like, right. where people poo. Men, you get, though, uh, abattoirs, you get all, like, this, this is when you start getting the city council really, really intervening in, sort of, uh, in people's bodies and how people use the city. Um, and, yeah, you're right, Leicester, Leicester Cemetery is, is part of this process. It's also outside the city, really. It's the... Well, it's not anymore, but it was then, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and it's beautifully it's segregated as well. Like, you know, that non-conformist section that has these very plain, unostentatious tombstones, whilst up on the yeah. hill are the rich which the, with these glorious Gothic kind of spires. I mean... Yeah, the, like, you know, the British class system extends into death as well, so don't you worry. And it was all very evocative in the snow. It was wonderful. I had a great time. Yeah, yeah. So it was nice. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Erica. We'll talk to you next week. Excellent. Okay. okay. I, I think we've all learned through it. What you say? Well, I think we will have death. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Erica. Uh, that was, um, that was, I, I, we had a great time in Leicester. And I do want to get in my story about the um, New College uh, Cemetery Memorial, because if you ever go to New College Chapel in, um, in Oxford, there is a, um, hello Artemis, I'm just talking about some dead soldiers. Um, there is a, a plaque on the wall, which is right next to the plaque which contains a kind of memorial to all the soldiers from the college that fought in the First World War. And of course, there are name after name after name after name. But next to this huge big plaque uh, listing all the names of the dead soldiers who fought for Britain in the war, there's a small plaque which has the name of three German soldiers on it. And these were students who uh, at New College who were Germans. And the plaque says... Um, it's something like, um, we, you know, we commemorate the memory of these students who entered into the inheritance or coming from a foreign land, entered into the inheritance of this place and fought and died for their country. Of course, they fought and died for Germany. So they were fighting against all the other people. In fact, they probably killed some of the other people um, who are adjacent to them on the, on, on the wall. But the point is that the university inheritance is one of service and even though they served um, served different countries they were still to be remembered as students of the college so I think it's quite a remarkable thing to have been set up in England in 1920 a plaque to dead Germans who fought against Germany I mean fought against England um, so that's one of my favorite cemetery stories uh, so we're back here now and um, Joycey hello Joycey Hello again. Hello again. Um, we've got some very loud microphones now. So what what have you got? Is this a lucky person? Uh, I guess so, yeah. He's a certainly a very interesting person. Uh-huh. Uh, he's called Jack Churchill, nicknamed Mad Jack. Um, and he's a very interesting character. So he fought in the Second World War and in a few other things after that, including like the Korea War. Basically any kind of army involvement he was there he was there trying to fight his way through but he's called mad jack because he had some little eccentric madness traits. issues yeah <laughs> um basically he carried a longbow with barbed arrows and he's um the only british soldier known to have felled an enemy with a longbow in world war Two. and after fighting at dunkirk he volunteered for the commandos 
So right. he ends up going and fighting in Norway and all sorts of other places. But he's very leg- legendary because he sort of he carried around bagpipes, and um, at one point, he, like sort of the story is, he runs off the boat and leaps into the water and plays a tune on his bagpipes before just running off and you know <laughs> throwing a grenade and just being <clears throat> a bit mad, really. <clears throat> And he also carried a long broadsword, which he used to kill and attack people. So <laughs> he's lucky in that he did not die yeah, until just... 1996. Wow. And D- he said his biggest regret was not being killed in battle. <laughs> so he, he's he tried amazing. quite hard to get killed in battle, by the yeah, sounds of no, it. Yeah, he really did. He, he led commandos in Yugoslavia, and when the partisans refused to fight with him because they thought it was a bit dangerous, he led a motley crew to go and fight and he was just a bit nuts and he got um caught in germany and was transferred to sachsenhausen concentration camp and he actually i think he tried to escape uh, he and another officer crawled under wire through an abandoned drain and attempted to walk to the baltic coast <laughs> from berlin yeah not nuts nuts that's that's a fair way yeah yeah they were actually captured near the coastal city of rostock so it wasn't too far like they were very they close to made a it. complete escape. So then after that, um, they were just prisoners for ages. And then he ended up uh, being released towards the end of the war as all the SS guards were trying to make a run for it. And he walked 93 miles to somewhere in Italy where he met Americans and joined up with them. And he got sent to Burma because the Pacific War was still on. And he was just still really fighting. Oh, and he said that at the end of the war he said he was unhappy with the sudden end and saying if it wasn't for those damn yanks we could have kept the war going for another 10 years wow um did you ever find a wife oh hello yes he did he had a wife and he had children of course all the nut jobs in this world (laughs) there's someone for everyone out there you've just got to adjust your standards accordingly i've got a picture here of him running with a sword Oh my gosh! <laughs> wow, that's astounding. Like they're they're getting off the boats at Dunkirk, and there he is with a sword. I mean, do you think he's like one of the mad people that you send into battle up the front to kind of scare the enemy? Yeah, because he had command over like groups of people. Yeah, so. this is what's wrong with the English <laughs> officer class. You know that actually we don't care whether they're functional or not as long as they're just elite enough. Now. Artemis is coming, but she's like decided to be a diva today about not about dumb ways to die. However, I am going to historicize dumb ways to die. That is what I do. So let's see if we can uh, play. Set fire to your hair. Poke a stick at a grizzly bear. Eat medicine that's out of date. Use your private parts as piranha bait. Dumb ways to die. So many dumb ways to die. die. Now, one thing that um, we haven't mentioned, we've played this theme song every week for the last, you know, eight to ten weeks, and um, we have failed to tell you that Dumb Ways to Die is actually a advertising campaign that was released in Australia, of course, by the advertising agency McCann Melbourne. There you go. There's our, there's our footnote. And do you know what it was designed for? You have to watch like this video and the song goes on for about two minutes before you even remotely find out what it's about. Any ideas? Anyone? Anyone? I've read it. I You've know. read it. You know. I've seen it. I've read it. Oh, you can give the answer away then. If you deign yeah, to speak to us. It's about uh, safety around and on trains and around platforms and don't be dumb enough to die from a, from a coming train or something. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Which and is really random because, you know, all the lyrics are really nice and they're rhyming and then s- suddenly there comes the lyric that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, that's right, about the trains. And right at the very end, I don't know if you can hear this. I'm going to see if I can play it by the wonders of our dodgy... Um, Radio. This is this is the announcement right at the end of the song. Be safe around trains. A message from Metro. 
There we are. <laughs> is it? Is that like the please mind the garb please of mi- Australia? Be safe around trains. No. Um. Okay. No. Uh, but it is. There used to be in Australia. Um, a. I mean, this video went viral, by the way. So it it sort of was was hugely successful. But there used to be a very very graphic ad around drink driving in Australia, um, which was the 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 tagline of which was. If you drink and drive, you're a bloody idiot, right? Yeah. And um, and this is quite controversial because it broke a lot of the existing media laws, but it was a government-sponsored commercial, okay. and it was it showed extremely graphic pictures of car accidents. But it was credited with being very successful, and it came with a drop in the blood alcohol limit. And you know, if you ever drive in a car in Australia, you will get picked up if you speed. It's a highly regulated state. It's not like it's not like the wilds of Greece, Artemis. Oh, poor people, you cannot drink and drive. We're overregulated. That's we so can't sad. drink and drive. Oh, freedom, <laughs> freedom comes at costs. Uh, you brought more Uzo. Excellent. So speaking of Uzo, I went out last night to see a play and. The consequence of that was that I got to talk to... Oh, actually, it was a very good play. It's called Sour Lips. And it was about the... Um, I recommend you all go and see it. It's on an oval house, and, which is near where you live. And it was about... I don't know if you remember in 2011, there was this guy in the deep south that made up a blogging character called Gay Girl in Damascus. Yeah? And it turned out to be fake. Right, that this the gay girl in Damascus went viral. Her, she, he stole someone's photograph. Everyone thought this was real. The State Department got involved because uh, she was abducted, and all of this was him manufacturing this on his blog. And he was some white guy from the South of America. Anyway, he was exposed. But the play was about this whole uh, process, and it was absolutely brilliant. And afterwards, we got to talk to the um, author. Which was, um, and that involved much red wine. So I'm feeling a little bit uh, worse for wear, but then I came home and I talked to Simon about football, I think. Um, so this is, he told me I had to listen to this before I played it. He was much more sober than I was. However, I failed to do that naturally because I was recovering from the consequences of the wine. So this is going to be an experiment. Simon, hello. Hello, Simon. How are you? Probably a bit better than you, Sam. I have had some amount of wine. That is true. I've also been consuming culture in South London. Or should you hist and drive? Or was it hist and drink? Hist? Oh, you must hist and drink. Yes, always. What other way is there to do hist? Isn't this, isn't this why Oxford and Cambridge colleges have such a big wine cellar? To lubricate the tongue? So we're going, we're going back to the 60s and 70s here. Totals, totals. It's all <laughs> well, this is your period, after all. It is indeed. So I should be doing a tutorial then with one of the all-time great Oxford Cambridge historians who are always drunk. Oh, yeah, those ones. Those ones. They're probably hitting on you at the same time. OK, hang on. Speaking of, speaking of sexual misconduct, we're going to talk about football. Oh, this is a morning show, isn't it? <laughs> Technically, it's the breakfast slot, but let's draw a veil. Sometimes we at History Pitch like to have liquid lunch. Yes. Um, now, you were gonna, you were going to like tell me that England didn't invent football? I mean, of course they did. It was like a nun somewhere in Manchester that went out into the slums and said, here, kick this around. OK, so we're reinventing history quite dramatically here. Oh, well, come on. That's what all history is. It's invention. So the streets are lightable. <laughs> tell me, tell me how football came to exist then, and I will contest this. Well, what I'm, what I'm going to do is something you would probably appreciate as an imperial historian, which is to sort of off centre things. Oh right, D centre. I prefer off centre. <laughs> Offside. That's a football thing. Offside. It is indeed. <laughs> so this idea of England inventing football and then football being diffused without the world, throughout the world. With empire, no. With working class solidarity. Well, yeah, pretty much with empire. That's that's the kind of line which you still found up until quite recently in England. If you think about the 1996 England football anthem, football's coming home. Oh, wow. Ooh, nice. Ooh, 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 ooh. That's good. Okay. So this idea that England invented football, it's England's gift to the world, and football belongs to England. England is the home of football. Yeah. Now, when the Germans won, 
in 1996, beating England in semi-finals, they started singing Football's Coming Home. And this was very annoying for the English. So who owns football then? I mean, we all own it, right? Well, that's the sort of point I'm making, is that football had arrived in many places by the 19th century, early 20th century. It's been part of their modern history. And it's so deeply rooted in many cultures. If you think about the Dutch, it's impossible to think about the Dutch without thinking about football, total football. It's impossible to think about uh, South America without football. I mean, for Brazil, Argentina, without football. Though. Okay, okay, analogy, analogy, not very good argument about alert, but analogy alert. Catholic Church. Is it possible to think about South America? pick a country, pick a South American country and not Catholicism? Not really, but the kind of Catholic practice that we see there is massively indigenised. Yeah? Is this not similar to football? I think you can take that argument and go further. It's more than just a case of the English, t the English imperial presence in the world. And remember, you love this, the British Empire isn't just what we see on the map. It's British power and influence in the world in the 19th, early 20th centuries. So it goes to South America, for instance, even though it's not technically part of the British Empire. Uh, it's more than just this gets diffused with England and adapted to local conditions. It's more than that. Because it gets re-imported. Same with bloody cricket and the Church of England, right? They're exported, but then actually they're reformulated to suit often very, very local needs, and then they're re-imported in these new forms back into Britain. I mean, who's running world cricket? It's the Indians, actually. Yeah, I was aware of that. So is this not the case with football as well? Can we, can we not tell a story about... I mean, you know, I am, amongst other things, a historian of ideas, and I'm interested in how ideas travel, or how they don't travel, actually, how they get transmuted, transposed, transgressed, how they morph and change in the process of moving, not just across continents, but from one bit of the lecture theatre to another. I mean, you could argue that in cultural terms, football is the biggest example of that. Yeah. And so football is at the same time local, national, and international. And you can see that in teams. If you take Barcelona... Barcelona is a very local team. It's the kind of symbol of Catalonia. And it's also a Spanish team. It's the second biggest team in Spain. At the moment, it's the dominant team in Spain. And it's also international. It's universal. There's people from all over the world playing for Barcelona. There's people from all over the world watching and supporting Barcelona. Oh, 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 I have a question then. I've never really got this about football. Because Barcelona is trading like players as you said from all over the world they buy them in yeah how does that connect to the kind of little six-year-old that's going out to play football in the park i mean is the sort of global trade of soccer commodity you know people whatever his name is what's his name that's married to spice beckham him um, Beckham. They really are here. Just keep going. Does he? Does he alienate the six-year-old boy who's playing club soccer, or not even club soccer, soccer in the park on Sunday morning? Right? Are these two things stretched so far that that link breaks? No. I, what I would say to you is that even in the park, a young boy kicking the ball—that's the embryo of a World Cup-winning pass. You know, football is so beautiful. It's a beautiful game. Not all the terrible things that associate with it. You mentioned some of them, you know, um, accusations of sexual assault, violence, money, excess, all of this corruption, all of it can't tarnish football completely. It is a beautiful game. So the little boy kicking the soccer ball dreams of being David Beckham. Um, he dreams, but does he dream? This is my point, though. Does he dream of being rich and famous and sort of able to command money from whichever football club he wants? Or does he dream of playing for his country? Or does he dream of playing for Barcelona? Well, I would argue, back to what we were originally saying, it, it, it can be all these things. That's the point of this. Football shows that, uh, in many ways, things we're looking at with history don't have to be just one thing. 
they can do all these things. So if you're talking about that boy in the park, he is uh, dreaming of playing for his local team. He is dreaming of maybe making it as a footballer. He is dreaming of maybe winning the World Cup with his country. But also, he's just enjoying playing football. He's in that moment. Yeah. I mean, his way of playing football is very fashioned by how he watches it on television, right? We, like, the whole kind of... What is it when you fall over and pretend to be Maradona or whatever, going for the Academy Award because you feel... Like, that, that's happening on the six-year-old soccer, which I sometimes watch in my local park, is not... Like, that's not normal. That's not... That's learnt from the television and then reenacted as part of the self-fashioning of the little six-year-old kid as he's playing soccer to pretend to be hurt as he falls over, right? You're out of date, Grandma, because the six-year-old boy is playing football video games. Right. Because they're connected all over the world. <laughs> he'd be playing his... He could be playing David Beckham, or more likely he'd be playing Messi. Oh, he's my God. He, he's controlling his hero. He is. And he's also playing online in that game against people from around the world. Oh, wow. Okay. So this is like massively commodified in all its ways. You never, you don't actually go to the game anymore. Going to a Barcelona game is actually massively prohibitively expensive. And you need to access it via all these technological commercialized intermediaries, which is the branded shirt that you buy, which is the video game. This is kind of disturbing. I like the idea that you would go kick your football in the park and then you'd rock up at the football game on the weekend with your dad and that would somehow feed into a kind of larger patriot, whatever it is, effective identity shaping dissolution of self moment. But what you're telling me is it's all mediated by this stuff. But football just football just moves with the times. So when we when it first starts out, you've got as you were kind of hinting at, the churches are setting it up as a way of helping working class people. Nuns. The divisions and founded Manchester United. You have the divisions of the classes because there's a feeling of football being aristocratic and it gets taken away from the aristocrats by working class people. You get the way it follows the British power and influence in the world. It goes with railways. It goes with uh, trading companies. You know, wherever British people go in the world, there is football with them too. It's then really important, the rise of dictatorships. It's crucial for fascist countries and for the communist countries. And then post-war, it's really important to bring Europe together. And it's very important as well with the rise of television, the internet. Yeah, it's very, it's, it's everything, everything that's going on in the world, football is connected. Okay, so to summarize, the British invented football. It, it was exported along with their global presence and it morphed and changed to suit its environments in all these contexts and was reshaped, and it is a god that reigns supreme. However, the, the British invented it. The British codified. Codified. Begun. That's what they were so freaking good at, codification. Woo, I think I win, won that. I think despite no. being a bit drunk no. and it being half past 12 midnight, no. you British. might have just admitted British. that the British invented football. The British codified the game of football. They wrote the first laws, but the laws are so simple and open-ended that everyone around the world was able to contribute to the various forms that football could take. And that is the beauty of the game. No matter how we stay around the empire, they made people think that it was theirs. Football was invented by humanity. Oh, Simon, that's such a universalist concept. It's beautiful. Um, and on that note, ladies and gentlemen, I think we should end. It's it's lovely. It's been lovely. So we'll talk next week. I don't know what about, but something. It'll be historical. We should get sad. Maybe we could talk about memory in 1916 in Ireland. Okay, we could do that, yeah. Let's do that. Let's talk about the Easter Uprising and, and stuff, and Irish history stuff. Maybe... Okay. Yeah, sure. Let's before we even lend, let's talk about Easter. Yeah, maybe like maybe Erica has an uncle or something that has a statue of himself somewhere in Dublin. I bet that's true. I don't think you know Erica very well. Erica is on Erica's on the other side. I know she's a pretty, but trust me, there are statues of her relatives all over Ireland. Trust me. We will find this out, listeners. We will find this out and report back next week. This has to be cut. This has to be cut. <laughs> Bye Simon. Bye bye.
Bye, Simon. I don't know why you thought that had to be cut. That was I, I have not been so lucid for a long time. So now we're back to the studio. I know, I know. Thank you very much, Artemis. Artemis is here bossing me around as usual. But we're going to talk to my wonderful guest, Saman. Now, the microphone's on. Maybe you could move it a bit closer. Yeah, yeah it makes that lovely noise. Hello. 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 Now, Saman, you're from Kurdistan. Yeah. Could you tell us where you were born in Kurdistan? Yeah. First of all, thank you for having me here. Yeah, I was born in Kurdistan, in Iraqi part of Kurdistan, in a city uh, which called Halabja. Halabja. You know, yeah. In 1985. Ah. Yeah. And Kurdistan, and you're here as a master's student. Yeah. Yeah, on the history MA. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Kurdistan? Yeah, you know, Kurdistan is a vast land, you know, for Kurdish nation, but unfortunately, it's been divided into four parts in between Turkey and Syria and Iran and uh, Iraq. Yeah, and I'm living in a Iraqi part of Kurdistan. Yes, now. So. Do the Kurdish people are they able to move between these parts? You know, actually, the we have some relatives, you know, in another parts of Kurdistan, for example, in Iran. But if you want to pass the border, you need passport. But you know, uh, we have you know affiliation affiliation towards each other. Mm. You know. So, although you've got all these very close family ties, mm. yeah, how possible is it to get the visa? It's, I think it's a little bit easier, you know. For example, if you want to go to even to Turkey, you know, you you don't have to get visa before visiting Turkey. Okay. You know, you can go to Turkey and get your visa in uh, Istanbul. Uh huh. You, know, you don't need to get it in Kurdistan, for okay. example. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So actually moving between, say, Iraq and Turkey yeah. is easier than moving between Iraq and Iran. Iraq and Iran is easy as well, yeah. It's easy okay. because, you know, basically Iran and Iraq and Turkey are neighbors, you know, uh, neighbors, uh, countries. So it is easy. It's a good relationship between, yeah. between these Pakistan countries. and India are yeah. neighbors. But they don't have good relations. Yeah, they know. <laughs> but you know, they have same um, situation. Yeah. And they have Iran and Turkey and Iraq. I think yeah, they have same enemy, which is Kurdish, you know, nation, Kurdish people. So they they have you know, same aim and same you know enemies. Yeah. Mm, so mm. it make them to be more you know, to have a a good relationship between each other. <laughs> to face this, you know, this, pro this problem, yeah, this state. You're telling me that the nation is defined by what it defines itself against. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yes. <laughs> that but, was an essay question. Yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> I say that the Kurdish people, for a century, they have been feeding, you know, Iraqi and Iranian and Turkish national identity. Mm, yeah. Very interesting, yeah. yeah. I think so. Yeah. So can you tell me a little bit about the Kurdish national identity and maybe the religion and yeah. the culture? Yeah. You know, we have same history and, you know, same culture and religion. You have most of Kurdish people, you know, uh, roughly 95% of Kurdish are Muslim and Sunni Muslim, but uh, there are some Kurdish people are Christian, and you know, even some people used to, the, some Jewish people used to be, you know, living in Kurdistan, uh, and another religion, you know, mm -hmm. some, such as you don't know Hawari and you know Yazidian and Zuradash, some Kurdish Zuradash, you know, so but most of them are Muslim. A Muslim, and, yeah, Muslim. And so if. If there are these, uh, if the most of them are Muslim, but there are small groups of, of Jewish P Kurds and Christian Kurds, yeah. what makes them Kurdish? I can, you know, 
the place they were born. Yeah, yeah. yeah the but language the, they the speak. The history is the, yeah. the place, the language, and the same problems. You know, you have got same problems to face. You know, yeah. um, you have been facing persecutions. You know, and uh, devastation during this past of, of uh, our history. You know. Yeah, this long time of his, our history. Yeah, so yeah. tell me a little bit about that history. When mm. did the Kurds have the Kurds always been in this region? Yeah, you know, Kurdish people, you know, consider themselves as a most Asian, you, you know, people in this place. Some of the Neanderthal people, you know, Neanderthal people are they 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 have been <laughs> found in Kurdistan, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Asian our people. history, uh, our history, you know, stands back to a, you know, long time ago, maybe billion, you know, Billions million years. million years ago. Yeah. And I don't know about. I have no idea about the Old Testament in uh, uh -huh. Christian, but it's been written in Quran that the Prophet No. Uh, yeah. Landed in in Kurdistan. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, it is an it is an old biblical region in which yeah. Um, yeah. the stories sort of take place. Because yeah. maybe you could tell me a little bit about what the landscape is like. Are there mountains? Yeah, uh, there is. You know, there is a lot of mountains in Kurdistan, and it makes Kurdish people, you know, to to have a uh, a safe place. And yeah. every time Kurdish people. You know, say that we have got three main supporters, which is the God and our mountains and our pupils. You know, so mountains may made Kurdish to be more. You know, it made them, uh, it produced them, or you know, uh, offer them a a safe place yeah. to, to define. So, themselves. so when in times of conflict, yeah, do you do the people retreat to the mountains? That's where they, yeah. You know, in the past, especially, they used to be Kurdish people, you know, referred to. Even now, you can uh, see the Kurdish uh, liberation movement in Turkey, for example, PKK. They settled it in uh, mountains between Iraq and Turkey. Uh -huh. yeah. they, so, you know, Turkish government, you know, cannot get to get them, them, you know, easily. Yeah. So this this whole border region is actually quite um, quite mountainous and difficult for these states yeah. to penetrate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Are, are you from the mountains? No, um, for, yeah, some mountain surrounding yeah. you know our hometown, but there is some deserts and mountains, yeah. not just and some lakes and you know forests like, too. Aren't yeah, there? exactly. Yeah. There is an like, amazing place in Kurdistan. It sounds very but, beautiful. Yeah. Exactly, but in our contemporary, I uh, wonder to you know speak about our contemporary history, especially you Please. know when I was born in Kurdistan. Um, I don't know. Do you ha have you heard Halabja or no? But uh, when I was just two years old, it was um, bombarded by you know chemical bomb Iraqi by Iraqi regime. And I was just, you know, two years old at this time, and I we moved with my family, moved to Iran. Uh -huh. So, uh, and after that, you came back to uh, Iraq, and in 1991, um, again we moved to Iran. So, uh, you know, coming and yeah. uh, back into Iran between Iraq and um, Iran. So this was the first Iran-Iraq war. Yeah, that the U.S. was involved yeah, in yeah. in 1984 or five. The so last it, one of the then, yeah, Halabja was bombarded by chemical bomb in the last years of the you know yeah. conflict between Iraq and Iran. So, what consequences did that have for the city? The chemical yeah, still, warfare. Yeah, still, same. Pe some people still facing the you know some heart disease. You know, yeah. and some, uh, some people you know still are getting cancer yeah. uh, because of these chemical bombs. Yeah, very yeah. In dirty the, in the an hour, In the an hour, 5,000 people were killed, were died by, you know, 
this chemical bomb. Chemical warfare. Ch so, children and and women and man. Yeah. And and who who dropped those bombs? They they was Iraq. Iraq. Yeah. 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 This is Saddam, Saddam, Saddam Hussein. Saddam. Yeah. Um, how and your family were very lucky to be able to leave them. Yeah. To be honest, some of our relatives were, were killed by yeah. this chemical bomb, but my family, yeah, they still safe. Yeah. Thank to God. Thanks. Yeah. Th <laughs> exactly. Thanks be to God. Mm. What um what what are the people who are, what sort of sicknesses do they have? The people who stay. Do they? You said cancer. Yeah. Yeah. Some cancer and you know some m mental. Uh, even mental impact, yeah, and you know, uh, physical and mentally impact of people, and particularly mm. the children, yeah. even that yeah. weren't born exactly. in the, yeah, yeah, exactly. And it made Kurdish people, you know, to be more sensitive ab yeah. about another our, our neighbors, yeah. Turkey and you know, Iraqi and Arab and Turkey and Persian people, yeah. So what does the Kurdish nation want? Do they are they agitating for statehood? They, you know, Kurdish people, they want to have their own state, yes. such as Turkish and you know, Persian and Iraqi. But it has been divided by uh, in 1920 uh, by uh, French and British Empire. Mm -hmm. Kurdish, yes, mm -hmm. our government has been divided by. Uh, British Empire and uh, French Empire. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, the story of 20th century Europe. Yeah. Thank you very much, Saman. This is um, very fascinating. Thank you, thank for, you. for Thank you for us. having me. <laughs> it's a pleasure. But we're going to move straight from borderlands mm -hmm. <laughs> in uh, the Asian plateau to Alison Carroll. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Alison. I'm not talking borders for once today, no. so this is a change. What, what, we'd just like to like welcome you here to the his Thank studio. Thank you. Have it's some good cake. To finally be here. Have oh. some ouzo. <laughs> uh, I thought this was just a joke. It's real. No, it's, it's real, actually, though we've lost the bottle. Um, oh, oh, well, of course, Artemis is squirreled it away. <laughs> You've been wow. fighting tra public transport. I have, yes. I'm very sorry, History Pitch, that I'm so late. Um, window repairmen and public transport, but oh I'm gosh. here. It's like a catastrophe, cascade of error. Um, but, but we're pleased. It's fine. It's totally fine. We've been, um, <laughs> we've been talking about Kurdistan and other things. But what, so you, what are you going to, I was hoping you might tell us about alcohol in Alsace Lorraine, but. Oh, I can do. I'm happy to talk about alcohol. I suppose I was just thinking that. As yesterday was 80 years since everyone's favourite yes. mustachio dictator took <laughs> power, we could perhaps talk a little bit about that and maybe save alcohol for next week. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. OK, I'm always happy to save alcohol for next week and get some Hitler on board. Um, although I, quite, I think we should refer to him a bit like Voldemort as everyone's favourite mustachio dictator, <laughs> whose name cannot be... Stalin is competition, but I reckon he's still number one, I would say. Yeah. So what, what about, we're talking about memory and Hitler. Yes, Hitler and memory. So, um, well, I'm thinking about this because I was at an event yesterday at the German Historical oh. Institute to commemorate this with eminent historians like Mary Fulbrook and Neil Gregg were talking about it. But also Angela Merkel um, yesterday at almost the exact minute that Hitler was sworn in as Chancellor took yeah. the opportunity to commemorate it at the former Gestapo HQ in Berlin. Uh, they're actually pouring out the Uzo people. Yeah, <laughs> we actually coming out. a photo of this this, this day yet. So, like, uh, um, but also and Berlusconi did something appallingly horrible. You have to leave into so, oh, the Oh, sorry, photo. I'm in the photo. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know. Uh, <laughs> um, um, I'm on my own with three Uzos. Did you, did you hear that? No, I haven't heard about Berlusconi. I've just been very focused on Germany. Okay, we'll tell, well, I'll just do a quick thing about Berlusconi. He decided to say that Hitler wasn't that bad after all. I mean, no, Hitler was bad, but Mussolini wasn't that bad after all, and he's had a bad rap he, on Holocaust Memorial Day or whatever Oof. the event was about well, last week. Wasn't yeah, it? yeah, Holocaust Memorial Day. Um, astounding, astounding. <laughs> bid, bid for the newspaper front page, I would say. Um, yeah, it kind of steps on Merkel's point a little bit because uh, she's suggesting that, of course, they are all very bad and just as bad as we think they are. 
Um, one of the important things about the commemoration in Berlin is that it hasn't been as Judeo-focused as perhaps some of the past commemorations are, so the Sinti and Roma Philharmonic Orchestra was involved. Mm. But the point that Merkel was making in her speech is that German citizens and citizens of Europe need to be reflective on our political engagement, on its implications and on what it means, and that conservative parties need to be wary of the role of the far right and of incorporating these groups and perhaps thinking that they can control them, and that all of us need to be fighting and recognising the horrors that can arise and realising that human rights aren't something that we can take for granted. So... Do you think this is a massive set of grenades lobbed across the channel? <laughs> well, it all seems very, very prescient, doesn't it, given what's going on, mm. given what our current government has been doing and given the kind of bedfellows that they're perhaps moving towards, I think. But I hope it's been listened to and been taken note of mm. in this country, although I was surprised that there hasn't been as much coverage of yesterday as one would have expected. It's been very big in the French newspapers, mm. big in German newspapers, but very, very little in British newspapers. Yeah, who are obsessed with football trading today. and Yeah, there are bigger stories. Mm. What, what um, I mean, we were going to talk about memory. Here, clearly, the past is being mobilised. Mm. Yes, or, in very interesting ways, mm. I think. Um, I think that how we commemorate this is is very interesting because of what Europe is going through at the moment so Merkel made reference to economic crisis to social division to the implications of that on societies that are in crisis on political mobilization amongst citizens so it really is being mobilized for very for political means mm. so not just looking towards Cameron and what's happening here but also towards Germany where there are questions over the economic future of Germany's role in the Union mm. and what is going to be happening. Mm. So it's very, very interesting. I mean, do times. you think that is in some ways a little bit problematic as well, for many reasons, but one of which is that making the case for Europe is contingent upon this awful founding event, which needs to be... Mm. Um, heightened in some ways. It needs to be maintained and stoked in order for the solution to be viable or still be a political mm. future. Yes. Yeah, that's actually a point that some commentators have made, that Germany oh, high is... Oh, five me. <laughs> <laughs> that Germany is um, perhaps overdosing in saying sorry and that this doesn't mean as much for current generations who've just had enough of learning about Hitler and being forced to reflect on it, that it's impacting in negative ways, not just on Europe, but also on Germany's relations with Israel, with the way that the German state has felt it can't really criticise Israeli policy, even if criticism is justified. And so a lot of commentators have been saying that perhaps we need a slightly stronger a basis for a common European identity that doesn't just rely on needing to apologise and needing mm. to atone for past crimes. So the, neg the a positive basis rather than a negative mm. one. Or as well. I or think the two can go together. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how um, do you think... So so where did this take place? The Because the, space is obviously very important in where yes. you enact these great... Yeah, so most of it was in Berlin. It will be going on across Germany. So, for example, in Munich, there was a commemoration of the White Rose resistance movement, suppression, and mm. the assassination of its leaders, but most of it was in Berlin. So Merkel was speaking at the SS, the Gestapo headquarters. Mm. There was a commemoration in the Bundestag. Um, there was a commemoration at the Brandenburg Gate that was meant to reflect the SA and the stormtroopers marching through on the 30th of January. 33 and the cheering Germans that turned out to greet them. Mm. So it was very Berlin focused, which was interesting as well. And actually, the German National History Museum has got an exhibition which is just focused on Berlin rather than on the entire nation. So mm. it's very much focused on the capital city mm. rather than the sources of support. And what work do you think that's doing in the present? I think it's, um, well, it's interesting because some of it is connected with tourism. 
So visitors to Berlin can get their Nazi feel. You can download an iPhone app, oh, which you takes see. you through the worst crimes of the Third Reich, where things were committed. Oh so oh. this can shape your tourism and your tourism experience. And the same thing for a lot of the posters that they've got about Jewish victims and the concerts and things mm. that are commemorating it. I mean, on the one hand, you could argue that it's reinforcing this as a national a of a national point of memory, but I think at the same time it's distancing other places where levels of support for the Nazis were much, much higher yeah, yeah. than they were in Berlin. It's distancing them from the yeah. centre of, of well of where a lot of the events took place, but it is a distancing. So it's about a de regionalization. Yes. Of, yeah, and exactly. a centralization of the current German state maybe is Yes. That process that's happened since the Second War. Yes, yes, that is the case. Wow. But, um, you can also, is this uh, Auschwitz Liberation Light? Is this a video game? Yeah, for iPhones. It's an app. Oh. You can download it for free. You can, you can now liberate Auschwitz yeah. on your own. Isn't that exciting? On your iPhone on the tube. Yeah. That's wow. where we've got. Great, isn't it? And what do you think about that? Do you I think have, I haven't it, downloaded it. Just, just, just <laughs> but do you think it makes you. people interested in history, or do you think that this is trivialising it? I have really no no idea. What I wanted to say was that uh, Miss Merkel has made some serious mistakes in those commemorations. You know, in Greece, some people call her uh, Madame Hitler, <laughs> and making speeches from the SS headquarters it's it's not it's not going to look good yeah in Greece we're occupied again yeah, we're invaded yeah. they owe us money yeah, gosh. and now they're making speeches from the SS headquarters there yeah. you go there are some great blogs I'm going to find some and I'm going to bring you some yeah. no I mean that is mm -hmm. probably do you think she's thought about that the the, the, the theater and what it means for these for other yes. bits I mean, that's why shouldn't she I mean, I mean she's come on but well, she's because the European aware. Union is falling apart, right? And she's aware of the representations of her in Greece here with the swastika armband and those... She's aware of those images. I mean, so what do you think? I mean, do you think that she's just thinking, I'm, I'm clearly no Hitler, so <laughs> it's OK for me to speak here? Or do you yeah. think that she's aware of that? I mean, aware I of this possible reception? It, it would be hard for her not to be, but I think she's made a choice about who her audience is. And it's not the Greeks. And it's not the Greeks. <laughs> I mean, in Greece, this is right, right? That um, this loan, the enforced loan that the Greeks make to the Nazi state in like 1939 or 1940, I think, is remembered as part of, or is being cited in the current context as part of German, you know, they never paid this back. Yeah, that's true. And they were helped to recover with our money, they mm. came into our national bank, they took all the gold, and now even though they were helped to get back on their feet, we are to repay. Mm. Well, no, we forget the part with repaying. We have to beg for, no, that's not even that. It's, we have to pay them again. Yeah, so, and it's Germany. That is the, the, the interesting part. It's not the European Union, it's not the IMF, it's Germany for some mm. reason. Yeah. So this mm. is, I mean, we're talking about rival kind of forms of memory being mobilised, you know, aren't we? Yes. Inherently. Yeah. There's and no common story here. Which is very interesting. I mean, you would have thought that something, an event like Hitler's accession to power and everything that followed, would, could form the basis of a common European identity, yeah. but perhaps resistance to Nazism would be a means to build it. Uh -huh. But actually it's just revealing further fractures and yeah. how this is fragmented and ongoing resentment mm. that hasn't subsided mm. in spite of the 80 years since Hitler took power and the 68 years since the liberation of Auschwitz and the end of the Second World War. Mm. Mm. Wow. Well, I, we will take this up again, um, but then our, our, um, the next show is in the studio and we're making them wait again. And Jagvi, I just want to say hello. We're not going to have time. We're not even going to have time to see how Australian I am. And I did want to have a little brief rant, actually, because can you believe it? You know that citizenship test? They've changed it. Yeah, yeah, I saw it on The Guardian. <laughs> They've taken out all the hard questions, and now they ask rubbish stuff, like which landmark is a prehistoric monument which still stands in the English country of Wiltshire? 
That is now the substance of the UK citizenship test. A, Stonehenge. B, Hadrian's Wall. C, Offers Dyke. D, Fountains Abbey. Well, some of the immigration subsidies screwed up. No, I don't think, well, it's a policy change on behalf of our noble government, Jagvir. Um, and I also have acquired questions to the Australian citizenship test, which uh, we also don't have time to, to engage in today. But look, that's just whetting your appetite for next week. So here we are saying goodbye from History Pitch. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you.